scripture lesson is from Isaiah chapter 35, verses 1 through 7. You can follow along in your bulletin. The desert and the parched land will be glad. The wilderness will rejoice and blossom like the crocus. It will burst into bloom. It will rejoice greatly and shout for joy. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it, the splendor of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of the Lord, the splendor of our God. Strengthen the feeble hands, steady the knees that give way. Say to those with fearful hearts, Be strong, do not fear. Your God will come. He will come with vengeance, with divine retribution. He will come to save you. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer, and the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness, and streams in the desert. The burning sand will become a pool, the thirsty ground bubbling springs. In the haunts where jackals once lay, grass and reeds and papyrus will grow. Thanks, guys. Well, we're going to start a summer series about one of my favorite topics. It's food. Who doesn't love lunch, right? We're going to do a whole series on uh, lunch with Jesus. Meals that Jesus ate. You know, food is, is such a common part of our life, isn't it? How many of you typically have three meals a day and snacks in between? Yeah. yeah, it's very common, isn't it? Food is a part of big celebrations. Seldom does a birthday or a wedding or even a funeral happen in which we don't have special preparations and special presentation of special foods to help us celebrate those moments you know it's so so common food can be when it's presented with care a means of connecting deeply with other people beautiful or good nutritious food that's carefully prepared and and beautifully presented can be ennobling it feeds the soul not just the body sometimes food just puts us more in touch with our animal selves right who hasn't eaten fast food in the car on, quickly on your way somewhere before? Yeah, not so humanizing as other ones might be. But you know, food is one of those things that can be so rich or not. There are many, in this, uh, even in our own country, who are not quite sure where their next meal is going to come from or whether or not it will be nutritious. Yesterday when I was working on, on the sermon, I was sitting in the front room of our house that uh, is right near the front street and the sidewalk. And it must be that some beachgoers were walking by with their picnic because the whole room was filled with the scent of fried chicken. And I had been very contentedly sitting there typing away until I smelled that, you know. It made me think about meals that I've shared, some really simple ones. When I was a schoolboy, my mom every morning would pack me a lunch, and it always had the same things in it, a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and a little pack of cookies that she had made, baked them herself, and then wrapped them in cellophane, two to a package. You know, I think back now about that. Those meals fed my body, but they fed my soul. And even still, the memory of that strengthens me, heartens me when I think of all those routine daily acts of service and love from my mom. Food's a simple thing. Well, we are going to uh, talk today about one of the first things that comes up uh, in Jesus' public ministry. And it's nothing less than a wedding banquet. I'll read to you uh, what we find there, but I, I would like you to follow along. You can find in the bulletin that orange colored sheet has the passage, both the Isaiah passage that Cassie read and also the one from John's gospel. I invite you to read along here. Now on the third day there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. And when the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. And his mother turned to the servants and said, 
do whatever he tells you. Now, there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 to 30 gallons. And Jesus said to his servants, fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. Then he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. And when the master of the feast tasted the water now become wine and did not know from where it came, though the servants who drew it knew, the master of the feast called to the bridegroom and he said to him, Hey, everyone serves good wine first. And when the people have drunk freely, then they bring out the poor wine. But you, you've kept the good wine till now. Well, this was the first of his signs that Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and that manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. Well, let's kind of walk through what's going on here a little bit and then make a few observations about this familiar little miracle. Well, the wedding took place in Cana. Cana is a small, tiny little village that's outside of Nazareth. And Nazareth itself is not a big place. It's a, it's rural. Not many there. Jesus is there because, well, he's invited. His mom is there. There's a, a tradition from the, Cop, uh, the Coptic Christians over in Egypt have this tradition that Mary was the sister of the bridegroom's mom. Or the bride's mom, excuse me. But there's another tradition that says actually she's the mother of the groom. The, uh, the, she's the sister of the mother of the groom. Either way, the tradition is it's one of Jesus' cousins is getting married. And we do know that Mary's role there is somehow important. She's like a member of the family. She's connected. She knows what's going on. She's concerned about it coming off well. And the servants take instruction from her. We also know that Jesus is there with his disciples. At this point, it's so early in his ministry, public ministry, he's probably only got five or six of the, of the folks called who are with him. And they're there. Now, a wedding back then, they knew how to do it well. Agricultural life was hard, was demanding, a lot of long hours, year in, year out. There was lots to do. But when they took time to celebrate, they took time to celebrate. And a wedding would often be a week-long project, or at least three or four days. They'd start with a big feast and then move to the wedding ceremony itself. And then for a few more days, just celebrate being with each other. Sometimes they would put the bride and groom in a, in a little uh, shawl type thing and carry them, parade them through town so that all the neighbors got to see them and greet them and add their blessings. And then their honeymoon would be hanging out at their new little house together and neighbors and friends would travel and come and stop by to, ask their, uh, to give their greetings and blessings on a new marriage. And food was a big part of it, a beautiful part of it. They were celebrating. But now in the midst of this, a problem arises. There's a crisis. The wine runs out. Now that's a problem for a couple of reasons. Wine, uh, it wasn't uh, as, as heavily alcoholic as we think of as wine. It was a common drink every day. Uh, and it was how they refreshed themselves. Well, it would be a disappointment to the guests if the wine ran out. It would be an embarrassment to the newlywed couple if the wine ran out and it would be a disaster for the servants the caterers if you will if wine ran out they could lose their job their appointment their livelihood if they were household slaves they could endure a bad beating for this this was a a crisis and mary says simply to jesus their wine ran out she doesn't ask him to do anything she's just making a statement it's not a request. It's not a spoken request. She says, hey, Jesus, the wine ran out. You know? Now, Jesus' response can be quite puzzling. Woman, what do I have to do? What, what's this to me? Quit bugging me, Mom. I'm trying to have fun with my friends. Yeah, but Jesus, the wine ran out. Oh, okay. No, well, that, that phrase, it does sound really harsh. And we're not exactly what was going on there. But the Scottish theologian, William Barclay, whom I follow, he, he says this. This phrase, what have I to do with thee? That's how the King James puts it. 
she says, the wine ran out, and he says, woman, what do I have to do with you? You know, what is this to me? He says it was a common conversational phrase. And if it was uttered angrily or sharply, it could indicate disagreement or reproach. But when it was spoken gently, it didn't indicate reproach, but rather some misunderstanding. It means this, don't worry, you don't quite understand what's going on here, but leave things to me. I'll settle it in my own way. That's how Barclay interprets this. He says that Jesus was simply telling Mary, don't worry about it. I've got this taken care of. There's a, a, even that word, woman, we hear that dismissively, right? Not so here. This is the same way he, he responded to his mother when he's hanging on Calvary's tree. And tenderly, he in charges, or in charges John to take care of his mother and entrusts John's well-being to her, kind of gives them to each other as mom and son. And he calls her woman. woman. It's, it means more like lady, dear one. So another uh, guy, George Beasley Murray, you know, he notes that uh, this phrase, it's very similar to a Syrian phrase, which is, you and I understand what's going on here. So let's, we'll, we'll get it sorted. So it maybe probably wasn't harsh. It probably wasn't dismissive because what does Jesus do? He doesn't ignore the situation. She doesn't have to beg him. She just turns to the servants and she says, you do what he says. That's a good thing to remember. Do whatever he tells you. Mary is wise in that way. So he turns to these big pots. They're purification pots. They're used for ritual washing. People would wash their hands, sometimes their head, certainly their feet. And the family, I don't know if they have to borrow some. They had a big gathering. There's a, a banquet at their house, so they, maybe they have extra ones. Jesus tells them, fill those up. So the servants fill them right to the brim. They hold 20 to 30 gallons apiece. 120 to 180 gallons, right? Jesus sends uh, a cup of that stuff over to the, the master of the feast, the steward, and the, he takes a sip. He says, wow, this is great. And it's really good. He, he goes to the, to the bridegroom and says, what are you doing? Usually you serve the, the good stuff first. And then when they've had enough, they, you know, they, uh, you know, they may not notice as much. You slip in the bad stuff. But you save the best for last. So there's great quality. But not just quality. There is quantity. There's between... 600 and 900 bottles of wine made there, right? And the point is, this is super abundant. There's a ton of it, and it's really good. That's that's pretty amazing. It's over the top. Now, you know, Jesus could have used this moment as a teaching opportunity. My parental self, when the kids were much younger, never missed a teaching opportunity. Now, you know, son, if you're going to have friends over in a big gathering, you better check the fridge, right, to see what's there. You got to plan for these things. Think ahead. Stuff could run out, and where would you be then? Well, he doesn't. He doesn't lecture anybody. He just solves a problem, and he does it over the top. So let's think about this miracle itself for just a moment. Water into wine pretty amazing thing to think about right and it's the source of a lot of humor Eli told me a joke the other day he says Jesus walks into a bar he orders 13 glasses of water and then he winks at the boys and says the first round's on me <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah. wouldn't that be nice you know Jesus doesn't lecture he doesn't uh, you know reproach anybody he just apply, supplies with in- Incredible abundance. You know, often this passage is pointed to to say Jesus loved a good time. He wasn't against a great party. He was a social drinker. And, and Jesus invited other folks to have a good time with the good stuff and lots of it. You know, we do the cause of Jesus a disservice when we send out the message that somehow being a Christian Following Jesus means a dull time. Seriousness always, and dull, and heavy, and always thinking about uh, 
difficult stuff. No, the Christians of all people ought to people ought to be people who know how to celebrate, have a good time. And I wonder what do our neighbors here think of about us in Beverly? Do those folks at the Cove do they know how to good have a good time? Do they look like? Do they sound like? Do they act like? Do they smell like Jesus when he's having a good time? You know, maybe it made me think this. Maybe we should have a minister of celebrations. Anybody want to volunteer for that? Help us party. <laughs> Gil, he could bring his horn. That's part of it. I like that. <laughs> yeah. That's right. <laughs> yeah, we'll see what you can do with that water. Jesus has a good time, and, and, that, and he cares about it. He cares about a celebration and others. Secondly, we can note this. Who knows about it? Who sees this miracle? Mary knows. The disciples know. And other than that, it's only the servants. Jesus isn't blowing his horn here. He's not taking credit. The bridegroom and bride, they don't even know that things have been rescued by this miraculous intervention. But the servants, they know. They have eyes to see it. What do you think they were talking about the rest of the day, the rest of the week? Those ones. You know, I think miracles are around us all the time if we have eyes to see it. It was St. Augustine who first made this observation and then C.S. Lewis picked it up more recently. Some of you may have read his little book on miracles. He says that all the miracles Jesus does is actually just facilitating things that already happen naturally. Bones are being healed. Water turns into wine. It's a natural practice. It's what the vineyards do every day, year in, year out. Thousands of acres, hundreds of thousands of acres of grapevines producing uh, wine out of the sunshine and the soil and the rain. It's a miracle. You know, there is miracles all around us if we have time to see it. Food, you could, you could eat at, uh, you could eat a four-course meal at a five-star restaurant. And if you've got a grumpy heart, it'd just be miserable and leave you with indigestion, probably. Or you could take your entire lunch hour with just an orange and look at it, consider it. Look at its brilliant color. You know, peel back that skin and spritz it a little bit and smell that incredible fragrance. You could, you could marvel at the texture and the taste and let your mouth enjoy each of that. And you could have a feast, be filled with wonder and gratitude and awe at this simple thing that so easily we just take for granted. You know, I, I included in the bulletin a quote from Ralph Waldo Emerson that abundance is not a result that you create. Rather, it's an existing state that you receive. If only you have eyes to see, to receive the miracles that are around us all the time. A third thing to note is this. Mary's role. Mary prompted Jesus. Right? She, she goes to him and draws his attention to it. She, Mary, if you remember in the Magnificat, in Matthew's gospel, when she uh, is pregnant, she visits her, her cousin Elizabeth and she erupts in song. And the song is about God of justice who has particular concern for the poor. And Mary throughout her whole life, maybe it's because she herself was a poor peasant girl. But she know, and she sees, hey, she has compassion, she has concern and she directs Jesus' attention to what's going on there. You know, it might be not out of line to say that it sh- it's not out of line at all. Jesus grew up in Mary's household and she taught him how to be a good man. She taught him how to have eyes to see and a heart of compassion. You know, a number of years ago, uh, there was a consultation of the uh, Asian women's consultation. This is in 85 they wrote up in their proceedings stuff they had talked about, and they, they make these observations about Mary. 
He said that it was Mary's openness and receptivity that Jesus showed when he made the blind see and healed the sick and dined with public sinners. It was Mary's unambiguous solidarity with the poor that he exercised when he shared their humble and oppressed lot. In his compassionate justice, he put the good of humankind and the tyranny of perverted law, uh, I'm sorry, he put the good of humankind above the tyranny of perverted law in the same way that Mary reached out to those who could not help themselves. And in his fidelity to the perceived will of the Father, Jesus accepted the consequence of the cross, just as Mary stuck it out with him through the darkest hours of her life. Thus, if the scriptural image of Christ shows him to be a model of the new mankind, then it would not be very wrong to say that Mary was a model for Jesus. That's something to think about. Mary goes, she, what does she understand him to be? I, we don't know. But she takes her concern there and is confident that he'll respond. Well, another response to this, and this struck me right away. This was the beginning point, my way into this passage, was, yeah, but God, not everybody's celebrating a wedding today, and not everybody has an overabundance of wine today. There's actually deep want in this world, profound want. And you're, you're not turning water to wine. You're not turning sadness into joy. You're not making those uh, beautiful bushes grow in the desert like we were promised in Isaiah. What do we do with this? Why aren't you serving everybody? What about our world? One of the Jesuit uh, scholars I studied with down at Boston College, Michael Buckley, he wrote this about this passage. He says, One has only to raise their eyes to see poverty and suffering in this world. Those parents who watch their children grow up without education, without much hope for a better life. The migrants who shift with the crops in the Southwest, knowing bitterly that their children are condemned to repeat the lives of their parents. They have no wine. Or the millions of the aged hidden away in our cities or in dreadful convalescent homes, who with very little, little must eke out lives of threat and worry and terror with minimal substance. They have no wine. Or the despised or the feared or the uneducated men and women, especially the poor in the inner cities, whose lives are terrorized by violence on their streets and the hopelessness of ever getting through enough education or capital to escape. These ones have no wine. Or the debtor nations attempting to pay off their debts by progressively and unconscionably lowering the living standards of the poorest of the poor. These too, they have no wine. Women demeaned and threatened by violence at a disproportionate level and also of, un of financial insecurity. Patronized and discriminated against at the highest level of decision making even within the church and by their level of poverty in this world, they have no wine. And in this world of misery, the question Jesus asks turns Christians back to themselves. What is this to you and me? What is this world of endless sorrow to us? How should it shape our lives? You know, we could read, and some do, that Jesus' response to Mary was a dismissive one. What is that to me? It's not my problem. They should have planned ahead. I don't know how they got in this state, but it's not mine to deal with. But we know Jesus' response was one that understood his entanglement, his implication in the considerations of his neighbor. And he so acted. This little miracle ends with this. It says, so this was the first of Jesus' signs. doesn't call it a miracle. calls it a sign. It was performed in Cana. And his disciples believed. There are seven such signs in John's gospel. And they all point to Jesus. And the whole point, John says that he writes his whole gospel. The whole point of him telling this story and committing it to writing is so that others might believe. Others might see Jesus see his response, hear his call, 
and obey. To believe means to follow, and to follow means to obey, and to obey means to imitate Jesus in his care for those around him. Believe it or not, I think we have the opportunity to turn water into wine. Here's how it happens. With little acts of kindness. Spending time with a friend who maybe needs it. Offering a word of encouragement. Maybe it's sharing physical resources. The friends you know who have need. Or to strangers that you'll never meet. But who are desperate for a little bit more of this world's goods. It's happened to me sometimes that on a a regular Tuesday afternoon with just an ordinary empty hour, it gets transformed into something beautiful, something that is a gift to somebody else as I sit by their side and listen to them and I leave myself filled up with something more than a Tuesday afternoon should have been able to afford me, but it did. A deeper sense of connection and purpose and mutual belonging. All around us are opportunities to share in the plight of others and see God do miraculous things that transform want into wonder. Isn't that great? Well, we're going to look at more of these uh, stories about Jesus eating meals. And in this first one, we see how Mary turned his attention to the need of others and how he met it with great abundance. Hmm. Well, like Mary, let's have eyes to see the needs of the world around us. And like Mary, let's turn to Jesus. And like Mary and the servants, let's do whatever he says and imitate the one who calls us. Amen. Let's join together in our final hymn. You'll find it printed in there. It's 590. Rise up, O saints of God.